draw me close. Draw me close to you.
on this special day that he has given us to cast all of our cares aside and to lay every weight by the wayside and just focus on him this day. You know, I think back while they were singing, uh, I, I look at my life and I, I, I see where I struggle and I, you know, I, I, I shake my head at some, some, some portions of my life and, I, you know, I wonder how I'm going to make it. But just to hear and know that Jesus said that if I need to, I would come down and do it all again just for you because he loves us just that much. And that's the reason why we're in here today to worship and celebrate a God who loves us in a way that we will never, ever understand. And because we don't understand it, we shouldn't wrap our heads around it. The only words that should come out of our mouths are, thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way out of no way. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing us through that time in our lives when we didn't know when we were coming or going. But you were there. You've always been there. Your word promised that you would be there no matter where we are or what we're going through. And we celebrate a God who can do those things for us that no one else can ever do. So Lord, we just ask that you would accept our worship and our praise for you this morning because you alone are worthy to be praised. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for being so good to us. Lord, for, for keeping the lights on for us and keeping a plate on the table for us to eat out of. Lord, for giving us peace of mind in the midst of our storms, Lord. Lord, for just wrapping your arms around us when we needed a hug. Lord, thank you because we know that family can be there and friends could be there. But there is no one like you who will always be there through the good, through the bad, through the sunshine, through the rain, through the storm, through whatever. You have kept your word that you would always be there for us. And you said that you would be there with us until the very end. So, Lord, thank you for your comfort and your guidance. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be your children. And thank you, Lord, for being our God and our guidance and our direction that's going to take us to that day. Lord, when we get to look you in the face and hear you say, well done, we thank you, Lord, because we know that you're going to, 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 to lead us to that day. We ask, dear Lord, that as we come into this place, in your house, or, or online worshiping our own individual homes, that you would accept our worship and accept our praise. Because God, you're a good God. You're a great God. You can do anything but fail. You have moved so many mountains out of our way. God, you're a wonderful God. And we're here to lift your name this morning. So be with us. Help us to praise your name. And Lord, let words of praise flow from our mouths as we leave this place today to cheer and encourage someone else who needs to hear an encouraging word. In Jesus' name, let us all say, amen. morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Longview. We are grateful that God allowed you to be in the house of worship today. I hope you receive a blessing from our service. I have a couple of announcements and reminders. So every Wednesday, we have prayer meeting at 7 p.m., and on Fridays, we have Vespers at 7 p.m. You can join in on the Zoom line at 901-774-5431. And uh, there will be a game night tonight at 6 p.m. at the Boyd Residence. You can contact Mrs. Boyd at 901-264-5873 for the address. 
and that's 901-264-5873. Thank you. Praise the Lord once again. We have a special speaker with us today. Uh, about five weeks ago, Pastor Horton called me and he said, Mike, I, I got some bad news for you. And I said, what was that? He said, you know, I had asked you to, to, to speak on, on this Sabbath. I said, yeah. He said, well, uh, I found out that there was a preacher that was going to be in town. So I asked him to speak uh, for this week. He said, you're not upset or mad, are you? And I jokingly, and I got to make sure I say that with y'all. I jokingly said, well, now, preacher, hold up. That ain't right. You just can't do that to me. So I said, who's going to be speaking? He said, uh, Dr. Tucson Williams from the Oakwood University Church. And I paused and I said, well, for him, okay. You know, uh, this Sabbath, the uh, uh, Oakwood Academy basketball team is in town. And they're here in town to uh, partake of a Grizzlies game that's going to be tonight. So while they are here, um, Pastor uh, sought to use the... Uh, the, uh, the gifts and talents of Dr. Tucson Williams. Um, Dr. Tucson Williams was born in um, New Orleans, Louisiana, but he spent the bulk of his time in Houston, Texas. He, um, he met the love of his life in high school, and they've been married over 17 years. And they have two sons, Uriah and Eliezer. Dr. Tucson is a, is a very educated man. Uh, he has a master's in finance. He has a master's in divinity. He has a doctorate in character development. But the most important thing that, that, that Dr. Tucson Williams is, is a servant of the Most High. You know, Pastor had made mention in one of our meetings that once we finish having church at our individual churches, the bulk of us go and have church again online at Oakwood University, which is true. When you see some of their views, their, their online views, they go up with the 20,000. And um, I know Dr. Tucson Williams from um, him facilitating Sabbath school each and every Sabbath online for Oakwood University Church. And when they had a, um, a change in pastoral leadership, you know, I saw him step up and, 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 and take more of the weight in handling divine worship until God set another uh, leader in as their senior pastor. Um, in saying all of that, he's just a man that's trying to make it to heaven. Him, his wife, his children, and everyone that he has, he has crossed paths in his life. He's just a man that wants to hear God say, well done, Tucson, thy good and faithful servant. So after uh, the praise team comes with the next selection, the, the next person you will hear is Dr. Tucson Williams, associate pastor at the Oakwood University Church. back and get an old Longview favorite. <laughs> so we need y'all to sing with us. We haven't done this in a long time. This song was originally written by Kathy Taylor from, from Texas. And for many years, we didn't know who wrote this song, but everybody was singing it. But the song says, I must tell the goodness of the Lord. Y'all know that one? I'll see if you remember this one. Right here.
gave me strength. He gave me strength when I was weak. He told me to be humble and be. Christ was humble on the way to the cross. I'm excited to hear about the goodness of God, and, and I, I must be honest, there are a few things I, I want to share with you. Um, I, I, this, unfortunately, um, is the first time I've had an opportunity to worship in Memphis. I've been here several times um, in the city doing a number of other things, but this is the first time I've been an opportunity to worship, and, and I've been told that everybody in Memphis can sing. They can get three people from one pew and two people from another, and you have a phenomenal choir. And, and this today did not disappoint, and this is an amazing experience. So let's affirm our music team. We thank you so much for them, the praise team, and those who shared in their musical gifts. I want to also acknowledge Pastor Horton and his wife. I've known them since they pastored in Texas many, many moons ago, and so we had an opportunity to connect. I, I want to apologize, because and, and, and I'm not too far in advance, so if you want to come, if you still feel the word of God, just tap me on my shoulder, and I will slide away, elders. Okay, all right. I want to make sure we're good. I'm also 
excited to see Sister Wilson. Um, her family is very special to me, and I just, just have an opportunity to be here and worship with you. We praise God for you. And um, unfortunately, Miss Faye could not be able to be here with us. She, when we had the experience with the young man, and we'll have an opportunity to share a little bit more later on as we move forward. Um, but she sent me a text, and we told her we were going to come to Memphis. We said, hey, Pastor, um, we can cook for you if, if that's all right. And, and those who don't know my relationship with Miss Faye and Miss Felicia, um, every time they come into Huntsville, it's like the Lord descends in their kitchen. There is a way that they cook that, that has resonated with us for years. So every camp meeting, we find, just follow the, the, the wafting smells of the food and, and find our way somewhere to get a place. She said, Pastor, do you want to eat? And I said, uh, uh, yes, ma'am, since I'm here, I might as well eat. So we're, we're excited. So they opened the door and said, we want to come and hang out. So the basketball team is over at the Breath of Life Church, and they're going to be over in a little bit. And they're excited about what God has done. We've seen God do some mighty and marked things standing for the word of God. And so we're excited about that, but I know you didn't come to hear about a testimony about these guys. You want to hear about from the Word of God. So, anybody excited about the Bible? Anybody still believe the Word has power? All right, all right. So, we're in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. While you're there, I just want to remind you that the Bible says that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? So the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. There is a river whose streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the dwelling place of the tabernacle of the Most High God. He is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. He will help her in that right early. Psalms 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. We're in Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse number 12. Daniel chapter 3, verse number 12. If you haven't, say, I have the answer. All right, Daniel chapter 3, verse number 12. The word of God says, There were certain Jews whom thou set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. I'll read from the Bible here. Um, come on. For the prophets Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They have not served thy gods, nor worshipped the golden image which thou hast set up. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded, bring Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you serve not my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the coronet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast that same hour into the midst of the fiery furnace. Who is, who is that, and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? We're going to come back to that in just a second. Verse 16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, O oh God, if it be so, our God whom we serve is what? Is what? Is what? He is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. God is what? God is able. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods or worship the golden image which thou hast set up for the next few minutes, we will talk about a theme. Un we're still standing. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a good God. And so, Lord, today, like you've done so many times in this experience, that you will show yourself strong, that you will allow your people to experience you in a mighty 
and a new way. Lord, let chains be broken today. Allow people to say, wow, I didn't know God was that good and not good and just and good, just not just for, for someone else, but for me. And so God, allow our, our pain to give us purpose. Lord, allow our journey to allow us to experience your goodness in our lives. Bless us to this end in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 3 holds a beautiful story about the goodness of God. But the story of Daniel is one of tragedy because the Bible says in Daniel chapter 1 that God gave the children of Israel into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. Now, something, now how many of us know about the story of Daniel? Know the story of the story? All right, we, all right now have you heard the story of the fiery furnace? Fiery furnace? Yes? No, maybe so. Okay. All right, so tell me what's one of the guy's names. What's the name, sir? Huh? Who said? Naya. Okay, Naya. All right, me and you today. Don't worry about that. All right. Give me one of the guy's names that were part of one of Daniel's friends. Meshach. Okay, so Naya got it. All right. All right, you got one of the other ones? No, we just read it. It's right there. We just read it. Meshach. Come on, help her out, please. Shadrach, you weren't listening, you weren't reading, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all right, so we have these three guys, and one of the things about Daniel that was so interesting about this particular story is that these guys in Daniel chapter one made it a point to say, we are going to make sure we serve God, how old are you guys, how old are you, what are you age? 15, 16, 14, okay, you are the perfect age, stand up, please, stand up, stand up. Okay, so what happens here, can you imagine, and you guys live here in Memphis, right? Okay, you got family here? Okay, where are your family? Good. Great, all, this is all your people. All right. Can you imagine, as cool as they are, being whisked away to a foreign land? It was at this time, Nebuchadnezzar would come and say, get over here, you're coming with me. Y'all can see your face, you're like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I'm putting you on the spot. Well, can you imagine, you guys can sit down, y'all are great, y'all can sit down. What well, the idea was, these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, Shadretta, Mishetta and Abednego, all right, for the purposes of our time here together, all right, all right. These guys were your age when they were taken away out of their homeland, and they were, they were, they were, they were made to be slaves to this guy named Nebuchadnezzar. 15, 16, 17 years old, because they were the best and they were brightest. And what, what, the, what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do, he said, I want to make sure that they don't know anything about their family or their friends, and I want them to follow me in my direction. And one of the things he did in Daniel chapter 1 is he said, I'm going to give you guys food, any type of food that you want. You can have pig, you can have pork, you can have whatever you want. And, and these guys said, hold on, hold on, hold on. We serve a God who we believe in. Our bodies are the temple of the Lord. And so in Daniel chapter 1, they made a pact. They said, okay, King, hold on just a second. What we're going to do is we're going to give us 10 days. How many days? How many days? 10 days. So they went 10 days, and in these 10 days, they said, we're going to just have Beans and rice, all right, rice and peas. What, what y'all call it down here, all right? We're, we're in the South, so y'all red beans and rice, cornbread, water. That's what they had, all right? And so they said, give us 10 days. We'll just eat this food, and, and after those 10 days, test us because our bodies are the temple of God. They said at 14, 15, and 16 years old that they wanted to make sure that they knew that their bodies were the temple of God. Make sense? Say yes. All right, so as they're making this decision, after 10 days, the Bible says that they were 10 times wiser than all those other guys. I'm coming back to you, all right? So you, that's when you get to sit in the front, all right? So for 10 days, they were 10 times wiser. And in, at a young age, being in a city they did not know around people, they had no business, just like you don't know, I have no idea who I am, all right? Right, makes sense? But they said, we believe that God set us aside and we want to be different. All right? And as a result of that, in Daniel chapter 1, God blessed them and made, set them aside. And they were now wiser and stronger and had more mental acumen than everybody in the city. Make sense? All right, so Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says God gave Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the one who was over the children of Israel now, he gave them a dream. All right, in Daniel chapter 2, the dream was about, what's your name, sir? Jesse. Jesse. All right, Jesse, what's, 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 what was, do you remember the dream, Daniel chapter 2? Uh, All right, okay, somewhat, let's work together. All right, God gave Nebuchadnezzar, what was the dream about? It's just, just an idea. Was it about a basketball game? Was it about? The dream was about uh, the, uh, the throne of God's habitation, that no one there could touch it. They 
there you go. Justin got it. All right, so here we go. The dream is correct. He had a dream, and what was in the dream? Sis, sing. You sing. Didn't you sing? Okay, I, I must tell her the goodness of the Lord, so tell us. All right, so tell us. Tell us. Y'all, y'all work together? Say what? The statue. Okay, let's see. She hit, oh, you see, she hit him. He's like, baby, help me. So he had this dream of the statue. Remember, wait, hold on, ladies. We are, we in Daniel. All right, Daniel chapter 10, chapter 2, there was a dream of the statue. All right? Daniel chapter 1, it was about the food. About the what? Food, because our bodies are the temple of... All right, I got that. Daniel chapter 2, there was a situation where God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream, a dream of a statue. The Bible says the head was the head of, anybody remember? Gold. Then the chest was, think of the Olympics, second place. Silver. And then the thighs was eyes of, third place. Guess what? Bronze. And then the legs are iron and the feet were iron and clay. All right, and so what God did in Daniel chapter 2, this is critical, doing some background. What God did in Daniel chapter 2 was he showed Nebuchadnezzar from history, a history of where he is, and at the, at the end of all of those different kingdoms represented by metals, then someone else, I meaning God's kingdom would be set up, and God's kingdom would be the one that would reign forever and ever. That's the one that we want to see return very quickly. That's the one that's going to put all this food and all of this foolishness. And so we identify in Daniel chapter 2 that God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. Daniel said, you king are the head of gold and you are going to show, God's going to use you to be, to be a, to let the rest of the world know what he is trying to do. And that's ultimately reveal himself to the rest of the world. All right. Daniel chapter 1, we talked about the body and our bodies are the temple of what? God. All right. Daniel chapter 2, we had an image of, Nebuchadnezzar had an image of, image of different metals, right? All right. And each one of these experiences, what God was trying to do was in using the Israelites to let the rest of the world know that he was the one and true God. The history, the story of Daniel, if you ever read the book, the whole thing is about folks letting people, God letting folks know that he is the one and true God. All right. That's the focus of Daniel, that not only is God just a one and true God, but God is the God. What's your name, boss? You forgot your name? What's your name? Jeremiah. You got a Bible name. All right. So, Jeremiah, what God is doing, what we're seeing in Daniel, is God wants to be just like this. The way you're sitting down, he wants to sit down and say, what's up, Jay? How you doing? Good? You had a good day? All right. Good. What are we going to do this evening? Don't know yet? You're not going to do the 6 o'clock game day? Because you didn't invite me. Wow, I boo. This is what God wants to do in Daniel. He wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. He wants to have a personal relationship. And ultimately, what God wants to do is he wants to save us. He wants to do what? He also wants to reveal that he is ultimately in charge. And any time we as humans go outside the will of God, there's always problems and challenges. And what we're doing in setting up Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2, what God revealed in Daniel chapter 2 is that Dad, I'm allowing you to be in charge so that you can let the rest of the world know who I am. But when we open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 3, we have a challenge. We have a what? We have a predicament. We have an issue. We have some challenge where God told Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 that you are this head of gold. You're the head of what? In Daniel chapter 3, we have an entire image made of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was like, ah, I like the idea of being a head, but why not just be the head? Why don't I just take everything? In fact, the Bible says the reason why Nebuchadnezzar, the idea is to do some research. The reason why Nebuchadnezzar did this is because he said, God, I'm not, I'm not okay with the way that you bless me. I don't believe that what you have for me is just for me. Back. I want more than what you promised me. In fact, notice what this says. I was doing some research here in Pray Tracks. The, 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 the book says, the symbol, talking about Daniel chapter 2, was designed of heaven to unfold to the minds of men the important events of the future. What was be, to be used to hinder the spread of the knowledge of God and desire the world to receive. Thus, through the devisings of ambitious men, Satan was seeking to thwart the divine purpose of the human race. His heart, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, was, this, was not yet cleansed from worldly ambition and desired self-exaltation. The prosperity of attending his reign filled him with pride. In time, he ceased to honor God and resumed his idol worship with increased zeal and bigotry. What Nebuchadnezzar ultimately tried to do 
was saying, God, I'm stronger, bigger, wiser than anything that you ever thought of. And Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel chapter 3, everybody now is going to bow to me. And so, when the music started playing, worship, give me some worship music. As he's playing, can you imagine in your mind, watching the scene, all of the governors, all of the, um, the, 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 the congressmen, everybody who's around in the nation, they begin to come up together. And the Bible says when you heard the music, you have to bow down and worship this golden image that I've set up. Can you imagine the story where everybody's around and, and now that they're watching this thing and everybody begins one by one falling on one knee? And then there's two knees, and, and people begin to fall prostrate on the ground. And all of a sudden, they say, hold on, wait a second. There are three guys that didn't bow. And where are we going with the story? I want to make sure we understand. The question is, how in the world was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego able to stand in something like this? How in the world were they able to say, man, you know what? I'm not going to bow. Why? Because the Bible says in this particular story, the same gold, golden image, the, 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 the fire that was designed to, to build this image was right in, next to the image. They left it burning. They called it a fiery furnace. And so in the, this particular story, we see this journey of, of these individuals willing to stand up in spite of what anybody else said. And I thought it very interesting when I got a call on yesterday. A young lady that I've never met before called and said, Pastor, I'm having challenges with my faith. Having challenges with my what? Faith. She said, how do I know if I can trust God? I feel like he's calling me to do something very specific in my life, but I'm not sure because I don't feel like if I made that decision, anything would change. And for 45 minutes, she began to tell about situations that were happening in her life and how she was disappointed and, and sad and angry. Why? Because, God, I'm, you're calling me to do this thing. And she said, I just don't feel like I could do it. And I asked myself the question, what is this thing about faith that sometimes can be so hard? That trusting God sometimes is not always the easiest thing in the world to do. Sometimes it feels like I'm literally going to lose my mind because God is calling me to do something that my feelings don't match up with. And what I want to let you know is we're going to break down today in understanding this thing called faith is that faith isn't the absence of fear. Faith does not mean I don't have feelings or negative feelings about what God is calling me to do. Faith says, God, I see my feelings. I may even be afraid, but I'm going to trust you in spite of how I feel. Let me make sure we're clear because this is the, the big point, the anchor point that we're talking about today. Faith says, I feel one way, but God, I'm going to trust you anyhow. You know, we've been, those of you following Oak Ridge University Church, we've been doing this series called Unrealistic Faith. And one of the things Pastor Svell has kind of shared with us and reminding us is that faith is not invisible. Faith is not what? That if I have faith, my actions should follow what I believe. And sometimes when we have to make decisions of faith, it does not mean that those decisions come without being afraid or being nervous about what's going to happen as a result of this particular action I'm going to take. And we as a Christian church have to understand that God is about to do great things in our lives, but we have to trust him. You guys may be too young to remember the original karate, karate Kid. Young Daniel was being beat up by these thugs in this place that he just moved to, and, and he went in and found Mr. Miyagi. And in the story, you, you, you remember, you remember, Mr. Miyagi had Daniel, said, Daniel, he said, teach me karate, teach me karate. And Daniel was like, I, I'm, I'm getting beat up, you need to teach me how to do what you do. And, and he said, all right, meet me here first thing in the morning, 8 o'clock, bright and early, before the sunrise, not 8 o'clock, before the sunrise. And he said, I'm, I'm here. He came the next day and was ready. He said, 
I want you to paint the fence. Mr. Miyagi, I'm here to learn karate and paint the fence. And he said, got out there and started painting. He said, no, 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 Daniel. I want you to paint the fence down, up, and down. Up and down. He painted the fence. He said, all right, can I, can I, can I learn karate? He said, no, 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 I want you to wash the cars. Wash the cars. I want you to teach me karate. And he said, no, I want you to wash cars. And he got out there and he begins to wash the cars. He said, no, no, no. Wax on. Wax off. Wax on. Wax off. And he begins to wash these cars, and he gets frustrated. He says, hey, I've been doing all of these things, and, and Mr. Miyagi, it does not seem like you're teaching me karate. And sometimes that perfectly depicts the way God teaches us this journey of trusting in him. He has us do activities that don't make sense. He puts people in our lives that challenge our Christianity. Y'all have any of those people that just rub you? Look. I know, I know in Memphis that doesn't happen, but in Alabama every now and again. We have folks that just, just rub us just in a way where it's like, ah, Lord, you can remove that person out of my life. And then we hear the word of God where it says his thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. And I want to let somebody know the very thing that you may be praying against could be the very thing that God is using to answer your prayer. The very thing that you're trying to get out of your life is, could be the very thing that God is using to expand your life and make it to what he's calling it to be. Notice what the Bible says in this journey. It says, behold, I go forward, and he is not there. This is Job talking about this journey of faith. It says, behold, he goes forward, and I'm there. Behold, I, can, I, behold, I go forward, and he is not there, and backward, and I cannot perceive him. But he knows the way that I take, and when I, he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. For the Christian believer has to understand that when God takes me to a specific journey, when he allows me to go through difficulties and challenges, at the end of the day, God wants us to shine. God wants us to be better where we were than when we got started. And so when we sing songs like, I must tell in the goodness of the Lord, we have to remember that God allows us to go through difficulties and challenges so that we can refine us and make us into the people God has called us and created us to be. You know what I found? Because Seventh-day Adventist Church believes that Jesus is coming again. You guys still believe Jesus is coming? I mean, at some point, he's going to break through the clouds. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. He's, he's still coming. Now, he's not just coming for you. He's coming for me, too. I, I, want, him, I want him to be there. I want him to, to find me. I want to be connected with my father-in-law, who we lost last year. I want to be connected with our loved ones. And, and God is going to do that. But one thing I found about the quality, qualities and characteristics of people that are going to be saved, found in Revelation chapter 21, verse 7 and 8. The Bible says that the people who are going to make it when Christ comes are going to be people who overcome. People that do what? Now, if you overcome, what does that mean you've had to experience? What would you say, sis? Hardship. There had to be some difficulty, some challenges that you had to overcome. And so I want to affirm somebody's journey right now that if you are going through difficulty, it literally means that God is preparing you for the kingdom. We have to rephrase the experiences that we're having because sometimes we say, God, I don't like this, but the Bible says that in order for us to make it to the kingdom, we've got to overcome. We've got to do what? Overcome. All right, so here we go. The Bible says, look how he talks about these people. These are people that aren't punks, that don't, that don't worry about, that aren't afraid of the end of things that the enemy's trying to do, that he keeps us and holds us together in difficulties and challenges. But notice the description of the people that are going to be saved, the Bible says in Revelation. These are people who overcome, shall inherit all things, and I will be their God, and he shall be my son. There is a relationship component to the people who are saved. Get that? Remember, Jay? All right, remember, right there next to you, right? Remember, all right, good. So here we're now connected to God, and now the Bible says also something very interesting. But the Bible says, it says, but... The people that won't make it to the kingdom are people, I don't know if you can read this, it says, but the fearful and the unbelieving? That hits the list higher than the people who are murderers and sleeping around. 
That's higher than the list of those who are idolaters and liars. And so the Bible says you can be a liar and make it and not make it to the kingdom. But also, if you don't believe that God can do what he said he can do, you're going to miss out as well. You mean I can come to church every week and return a tithe and offering and yet not believe in the word of God and still miss out on the kingdom? Yes. You can be faithful to your wife and still miss out because you're afraid of standing out in faith? Yes. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so what the word of God is saying to us today is that if we're going to make it to the kingdom, we have to overcome, but we have to overcome believing and standing on the word of God. So, what can we learn about being a part of these folks who believe in God, who trust in God, who make it to the kingdom of God? There's four lessons I want to teach you today. The first one is, my circumstances don't dictate my view of who God is. My circumstances don't dictate my view of who God is. What are we trying to say? Go back to Hebrew, I mean, go back to Genesis, Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to focus in on the conversation that Nebuchadnezzar had with these young men. The Bible says in, Nebuchadnezzar, in, Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel chapter 3, in verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, said, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they brought these men before the king. Shadrach spoke and said unto them, is it, Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you don't serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up. He gives them another opportunity to bow down. But notice what verse 16 says. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. We are not going to fix our mouths to say anything. The whole lot of pleasantries, the word of God says, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able. Now, now, family, this got me really excited because what the Bible says is that they were literally facing one of the worst ways you can die, literally being burned by fire. And they said in the face of Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able. Now, it sounds good on the surface, but as Nebuchadnezzar told them to heat the fire seven times hotter, the guys, some of the strongest in the nation, literally went in and threw accelerant in the fire. And just by getting close to the fire, they died. But one thing we learn from these guys is that just because they were faced with danger did not mean that God lost his power. And here's the challenge when this thing called faith is that sometimes we're faced with circumstances where our eyes see one thing and the Bible says another. That there are moments where I'm looking at my circumstances and it, and it does not look like God can do what he said he's going to do. And here's the difference between the believer and the unbeliever, the saved and the lost. The one that says, God, even though I don't see it, it's not going to change of how I, what I know about your power. Because there are going to be some moments in our lives where we're going to wonder, God, are you really able to do this thing? God, can I really trust your promises? And what I love about this story, the Bible says, it says, we are being so, or God is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And this is what I call big time faith. God, you're able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand. And verse 18 says, but if not, Yo, this, this is where I literally had to scratch my head. And, and, and here I am with all of these, you know, go after going to the, the, the seminary and, and studying all the time. I'm thinking that faith is, God, I believe that you're going to answer my prayer and blow up, make my business huge. I believe that you're going to bless me with a spouse. I believe that you're going to do some of the things I'm asking you to do. And, and if it doesn't, I'm just going to continue to pray for that particular thing. But notice what the Bible says about understanding faith. Faith says, God, I trust you to do what you said you're going to do. But if you choose not to do what you said or I want you to do, I'll trust you anyway. 
and this is mature type faith. And, and this is what I found the story, this friend found out this way. A couple of weeks ago, I have a 17 year old son who likes to eat. I mean, like, likes to eat. He, he enjoys eating. Like, when he goes out to eat, I'm, I'm like, you know, babe, can we, you know, find some place to have, you know, a two for one deal or something? Because these kids like to eat. And I have three boys in my house. And, and it happened this way. I, I love the way he did this. He called me and said, Dad, can I go out to eat? I said, yeah, sure. I'm in the middle of something, not worried about, not really thinking about what's he's, what he's about to do. And he calls me a couple minutes later and says, Dad, can you cash at me some money? Now, he has a car, and I know he has money. Or else he wouldn't have gone and said, I want to go out to eat. Well, I said, well, well what happened to your money? Dad, Dad, I, I've ordered already, and I just want to make sure I have enough. Now, since Wilson, he didn't ask me if I had money or when I got paid. He simply said, Dad, I know by his request that you have everything I need, and when I call, you're going to get it from me. The level of faith that my, had, my son had in me is not the level of faith I sometimes have in God. That he knew that I would not allow him to be left out there in embarrassment, especially if he called in my wife and said, be your God, tell my wife what happened. But the idea here is what I'm learning about God is that God wants us to have those type of experiences. We step out in faith and believe that God's going to open doors. But what happens if he doesn't? I'll never forget the call. I was sitting. We had just, my wife and I just arrived in Atlanta. And we got the call that my father-in-law had literally lost consciousness and was laying on the couch. EMTs were there. We saw it as faith. We were watching FaceTime. And we began to pray and said, God, we believe that you're going to answer this prayer and you're going to raise him up. And a few hours later, we got the phone call that he did not make it. And the question of faith came and said, God, we believe that you could. We, we claimed it. We were fasting from this experience. We believe that you were going to do something. What happens when God doesn't do what we ask or believe for him to do? Man, we can worship when we see God doing great things. We can praise God when he opens doors. But what happens when God allows that door to remain closed? What happens to our faith when we're saying, God, I want you to open this particular thing and do this for us, and God says, nah, I'm going to hold off on that one. Faith says what we find in here is that our circumstances do not change what we know that God said he can do. What is faith? Faith is standing on the promises of God and trusting him with the results. You see, you see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were, when they said, King, we're not going to bow, we're not simply being defiant, we're not simply being some bad kids with, with, with the, some type of defiance order. No, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they said they're not going to bow, they were standing on one of the promises of God, and one of the promises were found in the Ten Commandments. What commandment would have been broken if they decided to bow down to this image? All right, which says... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right? So what they were doing is saying what God is saying in the commandments, all the commandments, even though there they're, they're, they're can be um, they're, they're positive elements in each one of the commandments. If there's no other God before me, that what, in other words, what God is saying is that as God, I'm enough. If God is saying you don't need to have any other God, what he's literally saying is, as I'm God, when you worship me, understand that I am enough. And so for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we're not being disobedient. They simply said God is more powerful than this circumstance. And if it means that we literally lose our lives, we will continue to trust you even when we can't trace you. And so faith is, and here's the difference between faith and presumption. Presumption says, God, I want a new suit. And I go in and I buy a new suit, or I attempt to go buy a suit, my, my credit is declined. And I'm standing there, can you ring it again, run it again, run it again, run it. At the end of the day, I don't have the money for it. Faith says, God, I want a new suit, and if you choose not to provide it for me, I'm going to trust you anyhow. But also, faith is standing on the promise of God. And so what we have to understand is that as we're moving forward in this journey, this unrealistic experience, we have to believe that when we're moving and standing out in faith, that we're standing or hearing or receiving a word from the Lord. 
And if you don't know what God is saying to you in a particular circumstance or situation, you need to go back and pray a little longer. One of the things we're learning is that when you hear a word from God, that's what you can stand on in spite of difficult circumstances. And that's what these young men did. They said, we are standing on the promises of God. And one of my favorite texts, I mean, Psalm chapter 48, verse 14 says, this God is our God and he will be our God, he will be our guide forever and ever, even unto death. That when the child of God decides to follow God, we have to learn to trust him, even if it means it's going to cost us some uncertainty, even if it means death. Faith is standing on the promises of God, but faith is also, we identify point number three, is that God chose to deliver these guys not from the fire, but in the fire. Could it be that as God now has all eyes on these young men. Remember we find in Daniel chapter 1, 2, he's showing them how and who God is and letting the rest of the world know. And so now we have this group where we have hundreds of people literally around all of these leaders that are in this particular country and they're watching this on the plain of Dur, and they literally watch as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego willingly allow themselves to be thrown into the fire. difficult for me to imagine what they thought about being thrown in. Can you imagine as they walked towards the furnace and they had to step over the guards that had already passed because of the flames? Can you imagine as they were bound with their hands behind their backs and and tied up and they got thrown into the fire? I don't know what they thought about, but I can't imagine their journey, but they go in the fire and as they hit the ground, over there? Meshach, what's up, man? Yo, are we in the fire? I, I can see the fire, but do you feel anything? No, no, I, I don't feel anything. In fact, how did you move your hand? I don't know, but, but the, the ropes that were tied me, they, they, they burnt, and, but I'm looking at you, this, this, you good? And, and as they're talking, I don't know what they did, but as they began talking and looking and talk, telling each other inside the furnace, that they look around and they're in the fire, but there's no harm. And this is what I love about God. Sometimes God won't allow us to to be removed from some of the consequences of standing by faith. But in standing, he reveals more to us than had we stayed outside of the drama. So much so that the Bible says Nebuchadnezzar, who asked the question in verse number 13, who is that God who could deliver you out of the fire? Nebuchadnezzar asked the question that he wasn't ready to get the answer for. I'll never forget, I was in high school. And I probably wasn't as big and strong as swole as I am today. (laughs) This is a joke. But I had a really big mouth. I used to talk a big game. And I'll never forget the day we were over, my brother and I, we were over some friend's house, and, and his older brother, our friend, my brother's friend, was, they, they, were, they played cornerback. One was safety and one was cornerback. And, and they began to talking to me, and I began talking to them, and, and, and the conversation took a little turn. You know, I, I'm in their house, but I said, I, I may be the youngest, but I'm not going to let you just talk to me any old kind of way. And I began to talk to them and, and talk about them and, and tell them what they were and where they could go. And, and they began to stand up and walk towards me. And I said, I, I don't care what you, what you, want, what you want to do. I mean, I mean, stand up because in my mind, my brother's in the other room, right? But I didn't realize he and his friend went out to the store. <laughs> and so they left, but I'm still talking. Because in my mind, my big brother's in the other room. And as I begin talking and they're sharing and and they begin looking at me and they begin to, oh, oh, is that how you feel? Is that that what you want to do? Well, well, I'll I'll never forget. They they began to walk up on me, Elder, and and they began to just just move things out of the way. And I'm still talking to them because in my mind, my brother's still in the other room. And, And the crazy thing was, as soon as they stood up, 
it was almost like music in, in, in some type of movie beginning to play. Dun, 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 dun. And I see my older brother and his friend, and they come from my other brother, and they start fighting, we start wrestling. I'm like, yeah, yeah, because my brother was old. I just knew my brother was going to be there, and sometimes God does that for us. Where he allows us to let everything come play, play out, and it seems as if all hope is lost, and that's when God steps in. And Nebuchadnezzar asks a crazy question. Who is the God that's going to be able to deliver you out of my hand? I, I don't know how or what happened. He, he pushed heaven a little too far. He said, who is the God that's going to deliver you? I got the fire. I got this image of 90 feet high. There's no way in the world there's any God that you worship is going to be able to deliver you out of my hand. And, and Jesus himself said, no, angels, hold on. I got Gabriel. Don't, don't move. I'm going to get down there, and I'm going to show. If he wants to fight, I'm going to show him who he really wants to mess with. And what I love about the story is the Bible says he looked. three men bound. I'm looking and there's four and one of them looks like the son of God. You know, sometimes God won't show up until you stand up. But one of the favorite things I love about this story is not just God delivering them. It's this last point that we find in the Bible. It says, the people that threw you in will marvel at how you come out. Anybody notice that when you have drama in your life, the people, the people are always watching? That they weren't around when things are going good, but as soon as you have some type of challenge or issue, all of a sudden they begin to look. And the Bible says at the end of this particular chapter, notice what the Bible says in verse number 28. Number 26 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth hither. Excuse me, verse 24. I'm reading one verse. It says, Nebuchadnezzar and the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt, and the form of them is a fourth like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and hit, come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth from the midst of the fire, and the princes, the governors, the captains, the king's counselors, began being gathered together, saw these men whose bodies had no fire and no power nor was a hair on their head singed, neither was their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Everybody that watched them get thrown in got a chance to get a glimpse of the real and true God. What if your circumstance is uniquely designed to get somebody a front row glimpse of who God is. What if instead of the fire, you focus on your faith? Instead of doom, you focus on the fact that God is about to show somebody something about the power of God. And this is the difference for the Christian that's going to be saved and the one that's going to attempt, the one that's going to be lost. And the idea is that we are not going to falter, we're not going to be afraid. Why? Because we're going to stand on the word of God. This idea that the people that threw them in are going to be the ones that's going to watch them as they come out of the fire. I told you a story about these young men from Oakwood Academy. And if they were here, they would tell you, that this was the best season that his, in the history of the school. I know because my son has been talking about going to state championship since the beginning of his freshman year. Dad, when I get on varsity, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to score this, and I'm going to dunk on this, this person. I'm like, Dad, come on, man. Let's, let's get out of my face with all this foolishness. But they began to grow and develop, and these guys actually had a really good year. In fact, that this year was the farthest they'd ever come. They came second in their area, only to come to the state tournament to play the first game, only to have the second game to be scheduled on the Sabbath. Four 
25 to be exact. The crazy thing about the story was that there was another game at 7 o'clock that some sister schools were playing. And so we called and said, hey, guys, would you guys be open and willing to switch times with us so that we can play and won't have to violate what we believe to be the seventh-day Sabbath? Their response to our surprise was absolutely. We want to do whatever we can to make sure that you stand for your faith, only to call the association, the, the, the state association, for them to say, we will not change any games under any circumstances, period. You have these 12 young men who have been literally playing and, and, fast, and go, making sure they go on their COVID tests and doing everything necessary. And, and here we are, we're teaching them to stand up for God. And so we say, hey, listen, God's going to work it out. God's going to open a door. Don't worry about it. I'm sitting there looking at my 17-year-old son saying, man, listen, I believe that God's going to do something. And we were teaching them about faith and sharing with them, hey, listen, so God's going to open up doors. And we read stories like this. I'm like, man, God's going to do something great for you. She said, we're not going to stop there. We're going to send them a, a, an email directly. And, and we send an email, and they come back and say, we don't respond to, 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 to parents. We only respond to schools. So we tell the school, school, hey, you guys send a letter and you let them know that, man, we, we, we're looking for the God them to do something special. Everybody said that we can make the adjustments, but why can't we do it? And they get a response that we are not changing the time under any circumstances. The boy said, listen, we are going to go to the tournament anyway, just in case something changes. They drive the hour and a half distance to the stadium. They get out in their warm-ups. No change. And they watch the team that was willing to switch with us, and they play their game. And, at the, and the, the beautiful thing was these guys who had been watching them went over and said, hey, listen, we really appreciate the sacrifice you made. Sorry. There's nothing we can do. kids were despondent and a few days later there was a lady by the name of Kay Ivey the governor of Alabama she writes a letter and says I hate what happened to you but can I come and can you, are you willing to come down to the governor's mansion so that we can spend a day together talking about standing for your faith that Tuesday they get to the governor's mansion and with wide eyes they're looking around and saying I can't believe it. We literally went from playing, not being able to play to a basketball game, but literally being able to stand, thank, listen to me, family, to stand literally in the seat of power of, the, of, of Alabama. Family, Alabama is not us friendly all the time. And I watched as she pulled letter after letter from her desk reading, saying, Dear K. Ivey, thank you so much for standing on behalf of these young men for their faith. K. Ivey, thank you so much for standing up for the truth. And what, what I love about this is she said, she asked the boys, tell me a lesson that you learned. What, what happened? And one by one, they began to share about what, what they did. And one young man said, you know what? I'm glad that we got a chance to stand for the seventh-day Sabbath. That we had an opportunity to trust God and see that even though it didn't work out for us, that God's name could still be praised. These 17 and 16 year old young men stood in front of the governor of Alabama because they said we are not gonna compromise our faith. They thought it was about a basketball game. God was saying there's in the last days, I'm gonna do whatever I can so that the world can know that I am the one and true God. That he will work things out in family. The reason why I'm saying this is because God sent me here from Alabama to let somebody know whatever you're experiencing, when you stand on the word of God, God will blow your mind with how he opens doors so that you can let folks know about the true and living God. They began to talk and share. My son is the one on the left. And he said this thing I'll never, ever forget. He said, listen, there's some things I learned that are bigger than basketball. And standing for my faith is one of them. Put on Instagram, faith over everything. And on Wednesday, the front page of the news in the state of Alabama was a picture of these young men standing with the governor 
standing for their faith. The people that said no wouldn't answer to us, but they had to answer to the governor. <laughs> they thought we were too small. We're just a little small 1A school in a hick town called Huntsville. But at the end of the day, when my God gets involved, When my God gets involved, the Bible says he can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can ask or imagine. And they got a chance to get there and remind in spite of what the enemy says, that we're still standing. Somebody encourage somebody today. I don't know what your fiery furnace is. I'm not sure what your wrestle is wrestling experience with God may be. But he wants to remind somebody that if you stand for him, he will show up and show out. You may think it's about that thing, but God is doing something to bring all eyes on the situation so that when he does move, when he does open doors, when he reminds you that, hey, listen, I'm the one that's really in control of this thing, then when God opens doors, we can step back and say, whoa, what a God I serve. You may be here today, and I want to pray for somebody who's wrestling with this faith experience. And I'm not sure exactly what God is calling you to do, but I want to just remind you that in spite of what you may feel, still stand for your faith. In spite of how you may see how things may respond, don't, 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 don't look at the problem. Look at the problem solver. In spite of the circumstances, these guys had opportunity to say, God, I'm, I'm still going to stand and I'm going to trust you. And the people that threw them in had to clap for them when they walked out. You read the story, the Nebuchadnezzar writes a decree and says, listen, we are going to worship this God, the Messiah, the, the one that's going to come again. We are literally, he made a decree so that nobody can laugh at these boys anymore. Why? Because they stood for God. And God returned, stood for them. And so if you're here, if, if you have a prayer request, you're saying, Pastor, I'm, I'm dealing with this faith experience. And I just want you to pray for me so that I can still stand on the promises and on the word of God. God, I believe that God can do something special for you. I know that God's going to break some things, some, some ideas, some thoughts, so that at the end of the day, we can see that he ultimately is in control. You may have come today, stumbled through, or maybe you come every week. And you say, I need to make a commitment to God. Say, God, I just want to, by standing, I want to say, Lord, I want to renew my faith in you. That in spite of what happens, God, I'm going to trust you. So I'm going to ask you, invite you. If, if you say, hey, listen, God, I want to believe that you're going to do something special in life. And I'm going to stand. And simply by standing, I'm saying, God, I want to renew my commitment of faith to you that comes hell or high water. I'm going to trust you standing on the word of God. That in this last days, God is looking for people that are willing to trust him no matter what. And the Bible says that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That as we continue to, to trust in him and believe in him, that God is going to do anything but fail. If you may want to make a decision, say, hey, listen, I, I want to get baptized. I, I want to make a connect, connection with Christ. I, I've been out of the way for a little while, and I want to make sure I make a public commitment of a private decision. If, if you're here, I'm going to ask you to stand to your, to, to your feet or raise your hand. I want to say, hey, listen, I want to make a decision for baptism. I want to say, listen, yes to his will and yes to his way. And I want to join this particular church, the Longview Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church, to be a part of the family of God with fellow believers that are walking on the same journey so that I can, at the end of the day, believe, have with fellow believers walking and talking with me so that we can encourage one another as we go along our journey of life. Family, this is the best decision that you can ever make in spite of the challenges, in spite of the difficulty, God wants us to experience great things in our lives, and it comes by making a decision, trusting him as we live by faith. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for the reminder where you said you will be with us. And not just in good times, but God, you're with us when our backs are against the wall. God, you're with us when we're in between uh, the, the devil and the deep blue sea. When, when you're with us when it seems like there's nothing else or no one else we can turn on, that you said that you would never leave us or forsake us. So God, our prayer today that you give us the strength to trust you even more. That, God, you give us the ability to say, listen, come, may the heavens fall. I'm still going to trust in your word. We're standing today because we're reaffirming our commitment to you, that we're trusting you. God, we're standing because we're saying, Lord, the same way we're trusting the concrete under our feet, we're standing on the word of God, believing that it can hold us up even when the earth falls. Even when calamities strike our home, we can still trust you. And so, God, in spite of what it looks like, in spite of how we feel, we're asking today that you will do great things in our lives. And we cry like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, not I will, but thy will be done. We thank you for the decisions that were made today. Keep us we see you when you return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.